flavor of what uh, uh, we'd like to do today is essentially a, an opportunity for you to address uh, questions uh, to either myself, to either of the uh, uh, three uh, people who are uh, at the head table. Uh, but just to put it into context, uh, perhaps I could say uh, a few opening uh, remarks. Uh, I'd like to start by saying uh, it's been off quoted that uh, facing adversity makes one stronger. If we apply that adage to NASCAD, we should comfort ourselves with the belief that we are in front of ourselves because we have, have, we have had uh, a good deal of adversity over the past two years. Uh, we've passed through an incredible couple of years as we struggle to attain uh, sustainability. Uh, just consider what we've accomplished as an institution collectively in the past uh, six months, or the past five months, in fact, uh, since Christmas. Uh, we've completed, on time, two major mandated reports. Uh, one, uh, the Institutional Wealth Report, which was due the end of January. Uh, and we uh, submitted a, uh, an additional, or a second, sustainability plan, plan two, on uh, March the 15th. Uh, these are incredible in that we have relatively scarce uh, personnel resources and we have to find time within our normal schedules to uh, follow this report. But both reports have a uh, latent benefit in that they help clarify some questions for us. I posted these online so you can take a look at them, particularly our Outlook report that really should be a comforting document because it talks about our strengths and talks about our uh, opportunities and talks about a way forward. And uh, this is quite uh, medicinal to do it, although it's really quite time consequential. Uh, in addition to these two studies, we've also concluded two multiple year contracts with our teaching faculty without work disruption major, major accomplishment. Uh, we prepared proposals and vetted applicants and launched two studies on affiliation in space. All that takes uh, an enormous amount of additional time, but one of the kind type things. We want to get it right, and so we had to invest an enormous amount of uh, planning time in the preparation and in the uh, mobilization of those studies. Those studies are well underway now. Uh, we initiated a uh, search process for a new president. Again, a very, very consequential uh, action for the university. Some would say it's one of the most important uh, decision points in the history of the state in the upcoming future. Uh, we've also uh, began uh, planning for a strategic revisioning of NASCAD, uh, which will be followed by a more traditional uh, strategic planning process. And we've completed three external program reviews, all of this in the media spotlight. We, we, we draw a lot of attention uh, from the media. Unfortunately, the media tends to be more interested in bad news than good news, so sometimes it doesn't get slammed in the way in which we wish it to be, uh, be slammed. Uh, all the time that we've been dealing with these things, there's been an upside as well. And that is, we continue. I've never been in an institution where there's so many awards. I mean, I can't open the morning papers on Monday and uh, not see a notification of yet another award winner. And uh, you've seen all those through the year, and they just continue to keep rolling on. So we, we've had some very, very good uh, news stories as well as some of the uh, news stories that have highlighted some of the uh, uh, aspects of our struggles which we would prefer uh, to keep to ourselves. Uh, now I'm asked to assess where we are right now. Uh, feeling fairly positive. Uh, despite continuing tension, uh, I believe we've made progress with our principal funders, our principal funders being the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, we're far from uh, being out of the woods, uh, but we've demonstrated good faith uh, by meeting every deadline presented. In, in many respects, we're, we're, we're good. We're almost like the poster children for uh, 
for the city responsibility. We've presented challenges, we've met those challenges, we've done it in a timely way, and hopefully in a uh, arguably cogent way. Uh, we have uh, we've gained uh, the support of government in funding of the two studies that I made reference to. Uh, we've gained support for the cost of our strategic revisioning uh, project, all through the provincial, provincial government funding. And we've been successful in receiving support from the Innovation Fund. Uh, also, we've reduced our operating deficit. So this is what this was all about, this, uh, this uh, past year of trying to achieve sustainability. We reduced our deficit from a projected $2.4 million to a $1.3 uh, million. And uh, we've actually done better than that. And uh, that in itself was a major accomplishment. And uh, we were quite, uh, quite proud of gaining control uh, in the fashion that we've gained control. Not totally reduced, uh, or eliminated, I should say, but substantially reduced. Uh, so all in all, it seems as though as an institution we've been able to meet the challenges that uh, we face. So we have some grounds for uh, modest uh, uh, optimism. We think we are heading in the right direction. Uh, we think we have control over our, our central levers of influence, and uh, we're making some traction uh, with our uh, principal partners. So uh, uh, that's where we are. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, perhaps I could uh, ask uh, Rick if you have any opening comments uh, that you'd like to make. Should be, is this good? I'll talk louder. I was one of the people up here last year from the board when we had a town hall meeting, and it was probably one of the worst experiences I've ever gone through uh, because it wasn't a good situation to be in. We had to come up with a framework for sustainability within three months uh, for good reason because we weren't going in the right direction. We worked really hard to uh, get that done. In hindsight, if we could ever do it over again, we would try to have a lot more consultation. And you'll see that what we've been doing ever since then is having as much consultation as possible. We have the president's blog, we have the board's blog, we have uh, complete access to any of the board members anytime that you want. We are trying to communicate as much as we can through a strategic planning process that we're undertaking. Uh, the, uh, the whole uh, process of looking at affiliation and looking at space requirements is supposed to be driven by consultation. This board that I'm serving on now is not going to make any decisions unless we have full consultation, full input, and full information. And that has been our assurance uh, that we've made uh, to, uh, to the community. Um, I would say that from my own personal perspective, and I didn't make any notes for this because I didn't know I was going to speak, but I was asked to say a few words. From my own personal perspective, our relationship with the government's gotten better. Um, it's still not where I'd like to have it. Where I'd like to be is that we can go to the province and say, here's our destiny, this is where we want to go, instead of having it necessarily dictated to us some other way. And let me just go back and, and highlight the word dictated. The province has been very good at letting us determine our own way. We are just on different timetables. And I think we are now becoming more aligned on the timetables so that we can both get to where we should be together. Uh, but it is, it is a change not only for NASCAP or for all of the other universities. I monitor sort of what the other universities are doing, the art schools in the United States, watching what they're doing. And we're hoping by the end of this process, uh, with the new president coming in, with these plans taking place, that we can illustrate to you that we are moving in the right direction to maintain NASCAP as the number one art school in North America. Uh, but again, if you ever have any questions, I get uh, probably 10 emails a week from different people asking questions. Some of them I can answer, some I can't, uh, and other board members as well. We're trying to be a lot more engaging than ever before. Uh, our board really does speak up. We have Sarah on our board from uh, the student uh, body, and we've got faculty members. They are very vocal around the boardroom table expressing their views. And at the end of the day, I think uh, we are gonna be successful in, uh, in reaching our goals together. Anyways, um, on that note, I'd like it. I'm available to answer any questions from a board perspective. But I've got other people here that know a lot more than I do on an operational basis, so I'll defer to you. Thank 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 you
refer to them on any of those types of questions. So I'll turn it over to Rick Williams. And by the way, he's the one that has all the money. He's very important to be nice to. <laughs> You have to lean into it, Rick. That's the key. Okay, um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Uh, we've actually been uh, suggesting a meeting like this you know, for a couple of months, I think even back in the fall, kind of uh, expressing a willingness to come in and uh, answer questions. We, we're not here to make any announcements or express, you know, <coughs> suggest any new policy directions. We're very appreciative of the uh, of the, uh, the, the achievements of NASCAD that, that Dan outlined over the last year. We're, we're overall very comfortable with the direction, although, as Grant mentioned, we had a bit of concern about the rate of progress and the time in terms of sorting out some of these big issues. So we're just here to answer questions and have an honest dialogue. I, uh, Sandra constantly tells me to a fault. I'm very candid in these uh, kinds of discussions and tend to be so. Uh, and I hope you will be the same and, uh, and share your your concerns, but also maybe listen to ours. So I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. I wasn't intending on making any opening comments. I actually, uh, this is not a, um, a setting that I would normally do well in. I, I'm <coughs> much better in conversations and in uh, small meetings. So this is, I'm going to just feel my way through how this actually works at the beginning. And honestly, I'm, uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous. So um, not because I don't feel like I can talk to the things that we've, um, that we've been having constant conversation with everyone about, but just because, like I said, the, of the dynamic of the room. Anyway, Thank you. We'll start. Uh, look, I'll, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you direct the questions to me and I'll redirect them. If that works, uh, we'll continue with it. If it uh, seems cumbersome, we'll just uh, ask you to identify to whom you'd like uh, to address the question. Maybe we'll do that. Yeah, I don't think you have to address them to me unless you have a question of me. Uh, but when you, uh, when you speak, if you could uh, identify to whom you would uh, like uh, the question uh, uh, directed. We have a microphone here too, if you. If yeah, there's a, there's a microphone. Yeah, if, if, you, if you're not gonna use the mic, would you turn around and, uh, I'll, 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 or I could repeat the question. This is Gabrielle, who is uh, a member of the Student Council. Hi, I'm VP Academic on SunSCAD, and um, I just, maybe some of you have noticed that there's about five students in the room right now, and um, SunSCAD at the request of students who are kind of disappointed about the timing of this event, have um, we've hired Jose to film the event for us so that students can get the information that they can't currently get because it's uh, two days before school ends at 3 p.m. on a Monday, Absolutely everyone is in class or in their studio right now. Um, so I just wanted to relay that there are a lot of students that are really disappointed that they couldn't be here. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, this is the best we could do. It was either now or never. We thought it was better to go with now. We were also uh, led to believe that late Thursday or late uh, Monday afternoon would be uh, a time that would be uh, theoretically possible for our students. Uh, I, I guess I didn't fully understand the uh, scheduling of classes. We knew we were coming up to the end of the year. Uh, I, I've got a similar job to do. I promised a faculty colleague that I would send regrets on his behalf and a number of other faculty because uh, there are many classes going on right now and it's the final week of the term and uh, and he was very concerned that the empty seats might be misinterpreted as a lack of interest on the part of the NASCAD community and he just wanted me to be sure to let everyone know that uh, uh, there are many people who couldn't be here. Yet. I'm impressed with the term. I'm While I'm just standing, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to hear the uh, band's optimistic uh, report on 
changes, improvements in the relationship between NASCA and the government. Um, I'd like to hear uh, how Rick and Sandra see the situation as having changed, because I haven't heard that really anything from the government that would indicate that the government's position has changed. Uh, my sense is that there's, we're still under a tremendous pressure and there are threats um, concerning our very survival. So if, if in fact the government perceives the situation as having shifted in the last little while, I'd like to hear, um, I'd like to hear that. Um, overall policy direction has not shifted, so it's, uh, it's about the uh, progress in moving through the various stages of decision making. Um, we do not in any way, shape, or form, and I say in this instance when I use the word we, I would refer to the uh, overall decision making direction in the government, uh, in, in the cabinet, and so on. We do not uh, at all accept the idea that NASCA is under threat. Um, what we do anticipate is that NASCA will go through some changes uh, to adapt to uh, a changing environment, but uh, we have never operated under any notion that the future existence of NASCA was in question. Rick, when uh, the president of the student union and the president of the NSG local met with you, a couple of months ago, and you told us that the difference between the financial problems at Acadia, St. FX, and NASCAD uh, was that at NASCAD, it was a question of survival. <clears throat> that was the word you used. It sounds like there's a threat. I um, can't remember that specific statement at the time. I think what I would have, I mean, the exact wording of that, but what I would have been re referring to was the um, the immediate financial situation. Uh, we have other universities that face serious financial challenges uh, uh, close to, or perhaps some would say more serious than NASCAD. Uh, I think survival would be in reference to the sort of status quo model that's in place. And we're across the 10 universities in Nova Scotia, uh, we are uh, in a situation, you know, there, as uh, all of you are aware, there's been a 10% reduction in the government grant over three years. There's been a cap on tuition growth. So we're working through the memorandum of understanding with all the universities on uh, uh, on sustainability uh, uh, objectives. Uh, almost all of them will face restructuring challenges over the next few years. Some currently, I think, like NASCAD, you know, in the throes of that consideration. Uh, others will be getting to that stage very quickly. So this is not a unique circumstance for NASCAD or a policy directed specifically at NASCAD. It's an overall situation uh, in the province with our 10 universities. Um, we're working on that through an MOU. If you've been following media stories recently uh, in other provinces, uh, drastic uh, uh, funding cuts and, and uh, restructuring uh, uh, requirements have simply been imposed by the provincial government, not through a partnership or collaborative process. We're trying to do it uh, collaboratively on a systems basis. Uh, NASCAD was kind of the institution that had the, the most pressing immediate problem around its, uh, its uh, debt, debt circumstances and, and the campus arrangements. Uh, so it's received really a lot of attention from that point of view. Do you want to ask that, I don't know if you have questions. Is it okay if I just answer them? Okay. The, I guess I would echo what Rick said. The um, pressure on post-secondary is happening, not just in Canada, but and you know there was a quite dramatic cuts that, as Rick said, that happened in a number of other provinces. And as I talk to my colleagues, they're, they're difficult and, and conversations happening in the institutions in the states and the, um, the, uh, the western part of the world seems to be experiencing more about how do we change our post-secondary um, approach 
with a, a changing demographic, whereas the East is looking at how do we respond to a growing demographic that's trying to move into their post-secondary system. So it's resulting in the same kinds of pressures for, for both for both sides in terms of how do we how do we move this uh, forward. So. I have had this discussion, um, certainly with the, the students when we meet, um, the student associations, that is that this has been cast as a cost-cutting exercise, probably because there was a 10% reduction, but the conversation is actually bigger. And it's really about how can we um, ensure the uh, growth and prosperity of the province with post-secondary gain, a uh, significant so part of that. So because, um, it is uh, because, because of all the changes that are happening in the world, in, including how people actually get degrees now, <laughs> and um, the the, uh, the the changes that are happening there through to um, the the shifts and the demands for uh, the way education uh, is accessed. So it is. I hope at some point we get to have a discussion that moves beyond this narrow cost-cutting discussion into what can those social school secondary education system look like and what role, uh, and how do you see NASCAD fitting into that? It is a bigger and it's a more, it's a richer discussion. It's a more creative and imaginative discussion and I hope we get there. All right, first off, my name is Noah Logan and I, I want to nominate NASCAD and I want to echo Alvin and the student representative that there was no mention of this to any alumni, and I think that's also going to trust it, because there's a lot of alumni that, that lead vibrant careers in the community that still care a lot about NASCAD. Furthermore, I started school here in 2006, and I graduated in 2007, and my whole time at NASCAD, I fought with administration and the government for a right to be able to make art and there's a lot of students that still have to fight. When will the fight be over so that people here can make art and start a career and do what they passionately like and that the teachers can stop fighting and actually do what they want and teach? When can we stop fighting for, our, for their jobs and for a right to an education? Also, an alumni of uh, Sir John A. Macdonald High School, where you attended with my son. Um, uh, that, you know, we wouldn't obviously express it with the same kind of passion and perspective that you bring to this consideration. But what you're, the question you're raising is exactly what we are preoccupied with. How do we get this institution that is so critically important to this community and to the province to a place where people can? Have a, have a stable environment where we have uh, well-paid, uh, well-supported faculty, where uh, you have the facilities you need, a safe and uh, uh, supportive physical environment, all that. how do we get there? And where we started on this policy direction in 2009-10, that was not the direction, you know, before we were government, before this <coughs> current policy direction was established, that was not the track that NASCAD was off. And through a series of prior decisions by board, uh, beforehand and, and so on, the, there was a severe financial challenge. It wasn't about government reductions in government grants. Through the six years of the two previous memorandum of understanding with the university system in Nova Scotia, now the grant, provincial grants and NASCAD have, have grown uh, at a greater rate or to a, a greater percentage than any other of the any other of the universities. And oh, I think actually Kings University might have been marginally greater, but. Uh, so the, the, the funding arrangements in the province had actually been relatively more supportive of NASCA than the other universities. The province had invested heavily in the port campus and so on. But at the end of that six year period, which is when this government came in, uh, the, the financial situation was critical, running a deficit of over $4 million on a, on a $20 million budget and so on. So our whole policy direction has been from the outset, it wasn't about survival, you know, a question of survival or whether NASCAD would be there. The Premier and, and Cabinet were excited. There will be an excellent arts university in Halifax. Uh, 
Uh, and the brand and identity and academic model of NASCAD will be maintained, preserved, and we hope strengthened. But we have this uh, financial problem to get over, the same problem that the <coughs> public sector in Nova Scotia is struggling with. Uh, you know, the balance budget this year is the end of four years of very, very, very difficult to uh, <coughs> restraint, and it's not going to be easy to stay in balance. So uh, that, that's the same question we're trying to address. How can this institution, in this current fiscal environment, overcome past you know, decisions and, and uh, the debt problem and get to a place where it has, <coughs> I know it's kind of jargon, but the terminology we use is sustainable excellence. That's what we all want, that we're, we're going about it from uh, a government perspective. Hi, I'd like to respond to uh, a comment that Sandra made and then I have a question. I think that everyone here in this room would like to move beyond a question of finances, so that's a li little difficult to do when our courses are being cut and our professors are being basically fired due to lack of funding and our tuition is rising. So I think everyone would like to move beyond finances, but it's kind of impossible to do right now. Also, I had a question for Brian Beckham. Um, in your introductory uh, few sentences, you said you would uh, like some transparency, you think there's more transparency, except when about 100 students stormed the Board of Governors meeting looking for open dialogue, you were one of the first people to leave the room, and I don't think that there has been any transparency between the board and students. I don't think a blog really cuts it, and also I have a question, if a merger or an affiliation with Dollar Snoo came up, would you personally support that? Um, I'll try to remember, and if I forget, just let me know uh, the questions. Um, we uh, would look at an affiliation between St. Mary's and Dalhousie if it made sense for the best interest of the NASA. So that is something that you would Yes. If it makes uh, sense for the best interest of NASA, I've said that publicly, and I've said that before in front of uh, this group, and I've said it on, around the boardroom table. It has to make sense for NASA, not for the universities, not for the government, but for NASA. Are you talking about who's the NASCAD as people? Yeah, who's the NASCAD interest? If the board is communicating with students or with faculty? Well, and, and just on, on the communication side of it, um, I do think that we communicate very well with students. This board uh, reaches out to students on a regular basis. The reason why you had us get out of, uh, out of the boardroom uh, the night that you came in was because it was unannounced. It wasn't told to us that this was going to happen. We had to be in a position to meet with the province that evening to discuss uh, a plan that we were working on. They came in with cameras, and very many people around that table uh, did not like the fact that they were being filmed unannounced by a, a group of students, which they had no pre-notion or uh, notification of coming in. We invited the students if they want to come to the next meeting. Uh, we, we had open dialogue with Sarah saying, if they want to come to the next meeting, just let us know. We have to know, but we have to do it with a limited number of people. We have no issue with that. And that was to deal with your manifesto, that if you wanted to come and present that, we would do it. We were ready to line it up on the agenda, and about, we were advised that they weren't going to do that. But it's the fact that it came unannounced that in the evening that we were getting ready to meet with these two individuals, uh, we weren't in a position to deal with that situation that night. Anytime that you want to come to the board, put something on the agenda, or talk generally with us, we will entertain that. Maybe not the 120 people in the room, but if you came forward with a number of representatives from the students, we would do that. And we've made that offer. Yes, some people did say it was some students, and you weren't one of them. Well, I was getting ready to meet with the, the, pre, uh, the, uh, the, the problems to deal with a very important issue that we had to respond to. Yeah, but the rest of the people That's right, but I was the lead presenter for that meeting with the government. I had to be there and ready to go. We were supposed to meet with them at the time that you walked in the door. But I, look, look, in a perfect world, we'd like to sit down with you that evening to talk. But if the normal way that we would conduct business around the boardroom table is to have something on the agenda, and we would be ready for you to come in. We had a number of things that we had to postpone from that meeting because they never got dealt with. But anytime you want to come to a meeting of the board, let us know, we'll put you on the agenda. That's all we ask. Just like anybody else that has an issue, 
They put it on the agenda and we line it up and they come in. But anytime, call me up, I'll put it on the agenda. If you have any issues, uh, let me know how much time you require. And that's all we ask. And we did get a full report of what the dialogue was uh, afterwards from the people that remained. And I think that we support a lot of things that the manifesto said. We don't agree with everything, but there's a lot of things that we do share. And that's why we opened the opportunity for you to come back at our next meeting. I can't force you to come to the next meeting, but the offer is made. Some comment on your comment. On my comment. Um, uh, that that is that is difficult to have the conversation when there's money pressures. If the money envelope isn't going to change, then we have to actually have the discussion. So if if, if we're waiting to say solve the money problem first, and then we'll have a discussion of what NASCAD looks like. It, the envelope is the envelope, so let's talk about what, where, 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 what the, and that's for the entire, um, for, the, for the entire system. So um, let, let's have a discussion about how we can be, um, how we can work within that, and I believe we can, uh, and it's going to happen through dialogue to uh, to uh, create what that what those possibilities can be. If the discussion is no more money, no more, no discussion. Uh, a couple, there are a couple, a couple of questions on uh, your, your opening comments about the uh, tight backward position and economy backward positions. Uh, yes, you have a problem, but it's much lower. We haven't, we haven't caught any uh, positions. You're not replacing. We haven't filled. <laughs> we haven't. And your stated goal in the letter that you sent to the sustainability plan is to get rid of seven. Well, we will. So there is a plan in place to the <coughs> uh, the we, 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 we moved away from that sustainability plan. It wasn't uh, it wasn't funded uh, by the province, and so that that plan is no longer there. <coughs> However, from the point of view of institutional analysis and institutional management, if you are led to the conclusion by a comparison of all the benchmarks that are available to you that you are in a position of over supply or uh, over complement and at the same time you are incurring uh, significant operating deficits I don't think institutionally there's anything wrong with trying to reconcile those two points of disparity and uh, that's that's essentially what we did when we eliminated the courses. We subjected that to very careful uh, academic uh, planning analysis, and we were able to conclude that a, a vast, vast number of our courses were under enrolled, and significantly under enrolled. In some instances, where there were multiple sections of the same course, uh, I don't think there's anything uh, to apologize for in recognizing that state and uh, consolidating some of the courses so that there wouldn't be that chronic instance of under enrollment. As a matter of fact, despite the fact that we eliminated some courses this year, we still have a situation where we have 41% of the courses being offered at NASCA are under enrolled. And the enrollment thresholds are very generous, you know, they're set at a, at a relatively low level, uh, and uh, they're still under enrolled. So if you have to find savings, you find savings where you are over expecting. That's, that's all we're going to do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Mark, and I'm a faculty member in the art history uh, department here. Uh, there's a couple points I'd like to make. Um, the financial, dis we need to address the money here, and uh, among other things, we do need to address that. Uh, the construction of the port was a necessary thing, but it was also a big mistake. Uh, the provincial government did pony up their, con their commitment to that project, where a number of other partners did not. Um, however, NASCAD has been tarred in the press as needing bailouts and having made bad decisions and so on and so forth. There were members on our board who were part of the team that made that decision who were appointed by the government of Nova Scotia. And I do believe that some responsibility needs to be borne for that action and the consequences of it 
by the provincial government. So this leads me then to a connected point, which is that historically NASCAD has drawn many of its enrollments from across the country. We've pulled students from Ontario, from Alberta, from British Columbia, and elsewhere, Quebec, and so on. Demographics in Nova Scotia, we all know where they're going. And so if NASCAD is going to survive, it is going to need to continue to take its enrollments from the rest of the country. British Columbia has given huge amounts of money to Emily Carr. Well, I'm sure other people can quote me on the funds. I don't know what the money that's been given recently to the Alberta College of Art is, but it's already in a very good position. Uh, OCAD in Toronto has been given lots of money. NASCAD is the only school where we're basically being put in a situation of dying from attrition. And if we don't find a way to address the bad press that NASCAD has received, which is driving students away because of the uncertainty of not even knowing whether NASCAD is going to be here in another year, another two years, or whatever. I was on the bus the other day with a man who was sitting beside me telling the person sitting beside him that NASCAD was already affiliated with Dalhousie. This is what this is the kind of confusion that is reigning in public. So we have a situation that I think there are a number of parties that need to bear responsibility for. The final element I want to add to that is that NASCAD is not a brand, it's a community. And the strength of NASCAD is in its community. The white elephant in this room is that when you say it's not about money anymore, it's becoming clear it's about real estate. And there seems to be the pressure to get us out of this building and into the Sexton campus in an affiliation with Dow or possibly some other deal with St. Mary's where we would take up, we've even been told it's going to be three floors. So this is not just some dream that I'm making up. There is talk, there's rumors, and again, there's confusion about what's going on. And if NASCAD merely becomes an art department in Dalhousie or in St. Mary's, it will never regain the kind of community cachet that it has historically enjoyed, and it will become merely a hollowed out brand, and it will not attract the kinds of students and the excellent kinds of students that we have been attracting for decades now. We'll just become another fine art department. Who would come to Halifax from across the country to go to a fine art department that would be a copycat of every other university fine art department in the country? Nothing special and nothing unique. So I guess that's a question or several or comments. I'm not sure. But that's my view of the situation. Niche market. You're specialized. 
You're not competing with Dalhousie or St. Abacus or anybody else. You've got a, a, an area of excellent academic programming uh, that meets very high standards across Canada and internationally and so on. So you've already solved a serious problem that some of the other places like St. Abacus and Acadia uh, are facing in the future. How to differentiate themselves, how to develop sort of a target market or a niche or something that would allow them to compete nationally and internationally. So we've always looked at the NASCAT situation as one of a combination of uh, a debt burden and a, a campus setup that, by all accounts, uh, is, is not sustainable. You, the, the state of the buildings, the, the uh, quality of the facilities, the safety and considerations, it's all. So that's coming out of past reports and so on. That's what we've been working on. So to us, the notion of affiliation, that, as, as Grant has said, is only going to be pursued if it helps to solve those problems. We have no objective to somehow or other reduce NASCAD's autonomy or its academic standard uh, uh, reputation and, and its ability to succeed in, in, uh, in attracting students and so on. Our objective is to find a way to maintain what's best about NASCAD while kind of solving some of those problems that aren't really central to its, uh, its role and identity. So if sharing some campus facilities, uh, the premier, uh, when uh, Alvin, when you met with him and, uh, and Sarah and uh, one of your other faculty colleagues, uh, met with the premier, the premier uh, made the point that when he was a student, a student at King's University in the 1980s, um, you know, King's uh, was struggling a bit at that time with various issues. They developed that whole programming model around the specialized foundation program. Uh, they invested significantly in improving the quality of that program. And now King's is a very small university that is, uh, has greater autonomy, a stronger brand, a more developed program model than it had 20 years ago. It sits you know, on the campus of Dalhousie. It shares a huge amount of teaching and other resources with the Dal. It, it derives incredible benefit by that partnership that it doesn't have to do a lot of back office things or have a full faculty complement. Students at King's can have access to Dow programs, but they can also pursue their specialized uh, program model. So that's a form of affiliation. That's one model that could be looked at. Uh, there are a wide variety of arrangements. You look all over the world, excellent universities, Oxford, Cambridge, in fact, are kind of collect collections of colleges that affiliate in order to maintain particular kinds of uh, program uh, within, you know, institutional arrangements within that uh, larger setup. So, you know, I, I, sorry, this is a, probably a bit challenging, but NASCAD is a university in the field of creativity and design and innovation. A lot of the messaging we've been getting, particularly from the students and so on, is kind of don't change anything. Keep it the way it is. We're in a changing world. We're in a competitive marketplace. Nothing is staying the same. We want to engage with you in a really creative, innovative process around what should NASCAD be five years from now, 10 years from now. And that's where we'd like to see some real creativity applied. And uh, I, I don't think our kind of convers our conversation, so up till now, the last year or two, has been kind of as if we're somehow the enemy trying to do something terrible to ask it. Uh, we're not getting to the problem solving kind of. Thing. Rick, just to correct the record, when the Windsor report was issued, there was a press conference at Province House, and uh, in answer to a question from the press, the Minister of Advanced Education, Marilyn Moore, said that merger was still an option, speaking on behalf of the government. So we've been getting very confused yeah. messages on this. That the she, Minister of Advanced Education said that a merger was still an option. Yeah, and what she said, and I, I, I didn't bring it, but I just read her statement over this afternoon, if NASCAD chose to pursue that direction. Yeah. Uh, could I just uh, comment on that as well? I've been here for about a year, a little bit more than a year, both with my capacities of associated with NASCA. And one of the most bedeviling challenges I have encountered is disentangling and defining the words merger, amalgamation, partnership, affiliation, or integration. 
ratio. Uh, what I've discovered is when people use those words, they tend to uh, collapse all the subtle distinctions between them, and they talk about the one thing that they're talking about affiliations, they're also using the word merger. It's very, very difficult to separate them, but for our purposes, when we set that uh, proposal for the affiliation study, we were extraordinarily explicit in the language which we used in striking that study, and we were very clear that we weren't talking about merger, we weren't talking about amalgamation, we were talking about affiliation. And the same with respect to the comment, the, the, the comment Jane made about the three stories, occupying three stories in sex annoying. That's almost, that's a red flag for me because I have a personal uh, stake in it because it's been associated with uh, an interview that I gave. I never ever use the word three stories or the expression three stories in a joint building because if you go back to our, our space study <coughs> proposal, it states very, very clearly what the parameters of their investigation will be we will have to retain a distinctive and a clearly uh, different presence than would be uh, provided by occupying three floors in one building. First of all, it doesn't make any design sense because unless the, the, the stories were uh, 10 blocks long, we couldn't contain the space that we had to displace it before we get to the point that we needed to move. Uh, we couldn't contain it in three stories. So that was never ever uh, expressed by us, but it was expressed somewhere in casual conversation. And it keeps on getting repeated uh, by the uh, by the press, but we never ever said that. Nor are our uh, our uh, consultants looking at that as a model. And uh, again, we will only entertain those thoughts if it makes sense from the point of view of all considerations. You know, protecting protection of brand and things of that sort. We're very concerned about that. And the board won't make that decision uh, callously. They'll make it very, very cautiously. My name is Rudy Meyer. I'm a faculty member here. I thought it'd be useful for the audience to hear a footnote that I have having to do both with financial or, well, extraordinary gifts from the government or support from the government and real estate. When we had a campus on Coburg Road, we owned that. And we gave that, prop that property to the province in exchange for support on this campus so that the province in turn could give it to Dalhousie. So the extraordinary funds that we get from them are part of a deal that we struck with the government over 30 years ago. So it's not extra money. It's money that was <coughs> contracted between the province and this university. Comment? I agree. I was going to ask this about $131 of this follow-up, but it has to happen. But in all seriousness, I mean, we are uh, dealing with those issues and we're highlighting that history so that they understand that it's not a, a giveaway, that this is something that they are signing in the for. Here with our small time media, and it drives Dan and I nuts every time we hear it because it does sound like we're getting an extra hand in, but in fact, it's a transaction that any good data of the university at the end of the day. I uh, am against an affiliation, no matter what the title is, whether it's merger or affiliation. That kind of thing. It took me a lot of educating myself to get to that standpoint where I, I am against it. And um, the reason I'm against it is because in the case of NASCAD, when you talk about sharing services or sharing teachers or sharing resources, um, the only way that you save money affiliating is if a school has extra. And we don't have any extra. We don't have a head librarian. We don't have mental health services. We don't have these things. So you can't cut those to save money. So what are you going to cut? And when, it talk, when you talk about affiliation for saving money, in the case of NASCAD, it's really only talking about downsizing. There's, there's no extra to share. Um, and I think 
everyone in the room feels that.
through these affiliation discussions and so on, is let's not just survive. Let's imagine a far more powerful, robust, competitive institution that will pull in more students from other parts of the country and the world, because you're going to have to, uh, and that will offer excellent programming that will keep up with what's happening in, in, in technology and in, in, uh, communications, CI, ICT, uh, a whole lot of areas by partnering with other institutions that specialize in those areas, you know, urban planning, architecture, all kinds of stuff that's going on out there that can benefit from being close to you and that you can benefit from being part of them and so on. So that's the, what we want to pursue in a discussion about affiliation. It's not about merger and disappearing things and so on. It's about solving an immediate practical problem, a very severe debt load and a, a problem with you know, buildings that aren't altogether ideal. Uh, but also it's about building something and getting on a path that isn't just survival, but is moving forward to something stronger, more uh, creative, more contributing more to the products. My name is Sarah Hartengro and I teach in the painting department. Um, and not to ignore what you just said, um, I, I just had a, a question, I think probably um, specifically for Mr. O'Brien and an observation. And the question had to do with the survey. Um, I've been sent that survey a number of times because there was a student here and I'm now a teacher. Uh, and I spent a lot of time filling it out. Um, and one of the things that disturbed me about the survey was that there was a number of questions that, and, and it was multiple choice, which can't ever really be nuanced. Boxes for comments, which was good. Um, a number of the questions asked me what I envisioned for NASCAP, what a great NASCAP would be. But some of the questions were things like, did I think that if NASCAD um, uh, affiliated or amalgamated or whatever, uh, would students have better access to healthcare? Well, sure, of course they would. Would they have better access to gyms and um, libraries? Yeah, of course they would. But the, que the survey didn't ask me, what would I be willing, as a, and I'm not a student, but would I be willing to say, look, I'd really rather the students had a fabulous art education and I'm not that bothered about whether or not they have gym membership. So the thing that concerned me about the survey was how it would be read and collated and distributed and how this consultation, you know, I don't want it to be out motherhood and apple pie kind of consultation where the survey, the quality of the survey, garners the results that the surveyors want to have. Um, the other uh, uh, comment was, was just an observation, which was that before I taught at NASCAD, I did teach in an art department in the university, at the University of Western Ontario. Nice department, lovely, um, nice students, but the, the kind of education was utterly different because I had in my classes students that potentially dreamed of a career in the visual arts, but I also had students that were taking law and needed a class that they could just kind of bung in and not have to spend a whole lot of sweat over, class, the students that were taking biology, students that were kind of riffling through an education without being particularly bothered one way or another. And in the years that I've taught at NASCAD, I have, it, it's been wonderful to teach with students whose ambitions are powerful. They, they want to be part of a vibrant, uh, active visual arts professional life. And what concerns me, this is the comment part, what concerns me is that, for example, you were saying, uh, it would be great if Dal could share classes with NASCAD. Yes, but I would not want my third year painting seminar to no longer be able to talk in specialized language because we're accommodating people that don't know, for example, what the word palette means. Um, <laughs> and similarly, in my painting classes, and how are we going to do this? How are we going to, how, where, where would the gatekeepers appear in such a way that the, the specialized <coughs> teaching can still happen at a very high level? Um, sorry, my mouth is running. Um, the, the, the sort of final remark is, you talk about NASCAD as being a, a, a niche, and one of the things that NASCAD has done really, really well is provide terrific artists and ceramicists and designers to work in Nova Scotia and, and nationally. Um, that's one thing that NASCAD has done really well. Will it be possible to do that if we're going to have to, in a sense, water down the very high professional level 
um, that students require to, to do this work really well um, in order to accommodate students that simply don't have the background. Uh, that's a series of questions, good questions. If I could respond to your latter question first. Uh, you're way ahead of us in terms of academic planning, but keep in mind, we control. One of the things that we said that we needed control over in any type of alternative range that we might enter into is our academic program. So these are uh, matters of academic governance that you raised. In my own experience where students from sister universities are able to access uh, courses that are offered in a neat setting like this, they would never be offered at the third level or the fourth level. They'd be offered at the introductory level. I, that would be my guess, because we have very high standards of who we admit and who is suitable to enroll at NASCAD, given the, uh, the, the talent uh, component of our assessment. Uh, so there would be all sorts of natural controls. And it didn't work. Uh, I, I, I'm a, I've gone to universities where they'll offer separate sections for the casual bystander who has a curiosity of both art but has no talent to support the curiosity. <laughs> so you know you, you you could you could enter into all sorts of arrangements like that. So you're you're way ahead of us, but have confidence in our own academic governance uh, practices here. We can limit or expand uh, enrollment possibilities <laughs> as we will. Uh, but the, and the other thing is, I wouldn't always assign uh, evil uh, to uh, a scenario where you are engaging with people from other disciplines who can come in with a different perspective. I can see from an instructoral point of view and from a collegial point of view where that, that could be uh, could result in an enriching uh, educational environment. Moving on to your survey, I mean, the surveys are surveys that, that was intended to get a, 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 a sort of a, a I, I don't want to use the word surface, but a, a, a top of the mind impression of different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, with respect to the various issues raised. Now, it's not the perfect survey. You know, I used to do survey research, and so I had a little sensitivity around it. I was only brought into it at the very final uh, stages of it. I, but I, I don't do all those things here. But I do happen to know something about survey design. And my first issue and concern was that it's too long. It, it asked too much of the respondents. And uh, some of the questions asked were questions which they wouldn't likely have uh, answers to, so that you don't do that in, in uh, survey design construction. Uh, the, uh, but, but, but in fairness to the people who created it, they, they were addressing a problem uh, that they were doomed in one way, if they chose one way, and they were doomed in another way. And that is, uh, as you know, in addition to these studies which we are uh, conducting now, we also have in the works uh, the early stages of our revisioning uh, exercise. And the revisioning exercise uh, we wanted to do a separate survey. And so we said, well, what's the evil that we want to contain here? Are we going to oversaturate people with the survey one month and then another survey instrument, instrument two months later? And they said, no, let's, let's combine them. And so what we got was two surveys in one. That's part of the explanation. But you guys would point around the analysis of what people want. I guess the, the issue would be this is at least one voice saying I'm going to be really tick in two months time if I read yes. that NASCAD has decided they want gym memberships and they don't yeah. you know yeah.
we've given them very, very specific instructions to do the cross crunching and to be able to demonstrate to us where the savings are. Superficially, there is this view that through uh, uh, an integration of services, you would, I think I just lost, well, uh, integration of services, there are cost savings, but that's not really been substantiated in experience. So we want to we wanna see those numbers and the board will be looking at that very, very carefully. The evidence, we're, we're saying this is an evidence-based exercise. The universities ought to be respectful of evidence. And uh, we're trying to keep our wits about us and we're trying to say, well, let's give it a chance. Let's look at it. Let's uh, analyze it in every which way. And if at the end of the day, the evidence is there and it's compelling that you know, we, we, we would be a much uh, much benefited from uh, an association with a, uh, another university, or we would have to uh, struggle with that one. But we're not prepared to say, well, we don't care what the study says, we're, we want, we like ourselves exactly the way we are. I think we have to address that point. I've been making that point as well. You know, every institutional analysis that I've looked at the last number of years that have separated the survivors from the failures the survivors are always the ones that can adapt to uh, new circumstances, can reinvent themselves, can imagine alternate ways of doing their business and doing their business more effectively and more beneficially. And uh, you, you, I don't sense that <coughs> urgency here. I sense the urgency to stay where we are. Dan, just, I'm going to read Mike, but just to follow up on the comments, that you made. Um, I really encourage you to have the discussions with the schools that are affiliated. I don't think that ASD considers the master's mm -hmm. in Watertown because they receive mental health service support through um, St. Mary's University. So uh, I understand it's easy to go to the gym membership, but there's other affiliated services that are being received by the sorts of affiliations we already have. Yeah, yeah. So then, then there's no fear of the conversation, though. Um, there's no, there should be no fear of the conversation in terms of um, talking about what, what are other opportunities. That, that's not the impression that you get from the School of Architecture, and that would be the closest uh, comparison uh, to the situation that was in the age. The School of Architecture was fully merged. Merged. Is that yes. the line? Okay, well, whatever term you want to use. It has had to accommodate structuring their classes to the scheduling system that Dalhousie uses, which is part of their They only get part of Dalhousie. This an affiliation is not a merger. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'll make a statement. I will admit I did not do the survey because you didn't listen to, to me when I attended the school. Why do you listen to me now? Um, Furthermore, about the, the gym and uh, bus transit and all these possible affiliation benefits, we have those because of the hard work of the student union. We, we have a bus pass, we, we have Gal uh, Galapagos and memberships if we want it, as well as the hard work of student services. We, we, we have counseling services at Dow, and, and there's a lot of students at, at NASCAD that use them. And and they are great and they're very beneficial to those students. My question is for uh, is coming up with Jane said about the press, and it's for you, Dan, and Greg, and the rest of you can chime in. Um, how we look in the press right now is not very good. What are the four of you going to do to change that? Like, are, is Daryl Dexter kind of come to the wearable art show and shake all of our hands, or um, are you going to start to? A, attend our events, the Starfish Property Awards, and various things like that. Now I know, Grant, you do attend some of that. You came up and supported me in my, my event, and I was very grateful for that. But very few of the uh, Board of Governors ever go to an Anna show, and there's one every Monday, 5.30, and they've been having for years. We all know the time, we all go there because we're hungry and we can barely afford school, so we go there and eat. 
crackers and cheese. Um, so, like, are you going to kind of show, show, show up to our events and like get some press photos so we put that in the metro and say that, look, the good government finally supports us. Like, let's change the face of the public perception of how people view us. And it starts with you guys doing it because we, we, all, we are all trying to do that from our perspectives. No, I go to the, uh, the uh, exhibition every Monday night that I'm available. I'm both 75 to 80 percent. Uh, the, uh, the other point you made is another issue that is of some sensitivity to me since I've been here. Uh, I've never been in a situation where uh, the institution that I represented was the subject of so much media curiosity. I joke sometimes and say, I just have to uh, put something on the website at 5 o'clock at night, and at one minute after 5, I'll get a call from the media. It seems to me that that's their principal ob object to, to follow everything that happens at NASCAD. So it's really quite surprising. The other thing you have to, we live in a, a real world, and this real world of the media coverage is the media folks tend to, by instinct, look for the negative. Uh, that gets more press than the positive. That's one issue we haven't really been able to uh, grapple with. We have, however, been getting some really good news, uh, good news stories out there through our communications division, uh, the success of uh, some of our, uh, our students and faculty and alumni and winning awards. It's, it's, it's been pretty good. We haven't got a lot of bad press. Uh, but there's another factor which I find rather unusual here, and that is we, we really only have, given our government structure and given our legislative mandate, we have only a couple official spokespersons for the university, and there's absolutely no regard given to that by the unofficial spokespersons who are constantly uh, the subject of press coverage. Are and it supposed to be people, students or faculty? Students and faculty, and sometimes their views are perfectly aligned with the institutional view that we would like to get out there. But in point of fact, because there are so many speakers, the message gets diluted, and sometimes it's not the message that we really want to communicate to the press. But they have their own ability to speak, and it's their God-given, uh, protected right to speak. But it's not always to our best strategic advantage. And I find that a little unusual. There's not a lot of uh, convention, or there's not a lot of respect for uh, governance procedures. It's, I'm, I'm expressing my frustration now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe in the same theme, I think one thing that we, for our part, have not handled really well over the last year and a half, but I also think you share some responsibility, is that we've allowed this to become a media issue about survival of NASCAR. And, uh, you know, there have been demonstrations and people, students have felt, despite, you know, I think several face-to-face -face meetings and which we've gone over and over this, but students have felt it was appropriate to go out and say that somehow the government is putting NASCA in jeopardy as a threat and so on. That creates an environment in which potential students in Ontario and elsewhere are wondering, is this the right place to go to? Is there a future here and so on? I think we've got to stop that. We have to be looking like we're on the same page, even if you know we have all kinds of government groups, all ducks stop at the Premier's desk. And so we're dealing with school boards and health boards and universities and everyone that's struggling with these financial things. And in most cases, we're able to keep it on a constructive problem-solving kind of level uh, and, and look as if, you know, we may have disagreements and some tensions and things like that, but we're, you know, it's not, Nova Scotia is not a place in chaos that people should avoid. It's a place that's... But, but then, but you could do that by publicly rejecting the conclusions of the O'Neill report and rejecting here, here. the conclusions of the Winter report. Here.
Alvin. Well, I'm sorry, Alvin. We don't uh, we don't agree with that. The only report that. <coughs> that the government paid for that supported NASCA was the Hog report, and a, a Freedom of Information uh, request had to be filed to get that released. The reports that the government commissioned that attacked NASCA were released to the public immediately. The one report that suggested that maybe we were underfunded, the government kept the lid on. So the government has been responsible for all of the confusion in the public's mind about whether the support for the university. Well, as I said, our communications have not been perfect in this area, but having said that. <laughs> tell your political masters, no, no tell worries. your political masters that we're going to work actively to bring them down in the next election. We are yeah. not going to be quiet. We are fighting to bring down the NDP because of their ridiculous attitudes towards NASCA, and you just demonstrated why you do not, they do not deserve to remain in power. Thank you. Well, okay, that, I mean, obviously it's uh, free, you know, you're, you're free to do that. I would just encourage you to think <coughs> about what will happen, you know, what, what other government, this problem will not go away. No other political party that I'm aware of is making pro promises to replace the $35 million reduction in funding for universities. That could happen, but you know, you need to bear that in mind. But I think these communications could improve on both sides of this issue. Uh, it's not in anybody's you know, interest to uh, to describe NASCA as continuously being a threat. Uh, and you may want to... another example, Rick. If, uh, I'm pleased to hear that uh, the Dan and Grant are saying that there won't be an affiliation with Warsaw on NASCA. But two MLAs and a deputy minister told us that they were that far away from firing the whole board when the board wouldn't agree with the demands from the government. So we're hearing two, you know, I'm saying this because this may be my own, only opportunity to sit in a room with representatives from the board and the government at the same time. You're, you've been talking across purposes. The board is saying we will not give in to the government pressure, and the government is saying if they don't, we will fire the board. And I've heard this directly from representatives of the government. Now, Alan, here's what the government has been saying over and over again, and I can't imagine this changing with a changing government. The provincial government cannot, will not continue to fund substantial deficits in this university or the others. It's not a policy about NASCAR, it's a policy. We won't continue to do it. So in a, in a situation where you are running those kinds of deficits and have some challenges around needing to invest significantly in infrastructure, we have to get to a, a plan, a solution. Now, how's the universities over 100, uh, how much? 100 million. 100 million in debt, and how come they're not being forced to address that? They are. Oh, yeah. They are. They are. We are not going to fund. We are funding, we have been funding deficits at this university and, and one other, and we're going to be facing that, but we are not, there is, it's making it very, very clear that these are short-term measures to keep things going, but you're going to have to look at ways to, re to alter your cost structure. Who's now, how is he doing that? The same as anybody else, the same as all the others. It's not a NASA policy. And I think, Alan, we have not, for our, their communications have not been great, but we have not. Oh, I agree with that. Uh, Does someone have the mic? She's in the yeah. um, my name is Catherine Constable. I'm a full-time student at Nesthead. I'm 62 years old. I don't live in Halifax. I'm not from Nova Scotia. I came here explicitly to go to Nesthead. So I just wanted to make clear the context. Now, actually, this conversation that I've been wading through has made the point that I wanted to make. It, really, I just have some observations for you. One thing that I take as a takeaway message from the discussion today is that there's a lot of miscommunication. And I have to put the responsibility for government communications at government's feet. I, uh, myself, sent a, a letter to Daryl Dexter approximately a year ago, right this time of year, asking for a clear message concerning the future of NASCAD, and I didn't get a response. I think the, what you're hearing in the, in the responses from the students, from Alvin, from the faculty, from the various people, is that there is a feeling here that NASCAD is under siege. And so to go back to the comment that you made, Rick, about how you are surprised that there hasn't been a more creative response 
in this discussion, it, it's completely illustrative of the point that communication has been a problem. People here are on the defensive. People here feel under attack. And with all due respect to the two of you as deputy ministers, you implement policy, you don't make policy. So it's very reassuring to me to hear the messages that you're giving today about you know, a plan going forward and creative solutions and not necessarily a, a merger or you know, self-defined as, as in terms of what affiliation is. But I'm not hearing those messages from your political masters, the people who actually make the policy. So I would like you to take the message back to them that if they want to put the dialogue on a better footing, that they should put some of their messaging uh, on a clearer footing. The other thing that I want to say is that I've been wanting to come to NASCAD since the 1970s. In the 1970s, I lived in the Yukon. And there was something happening here. And this was before the days of social media and the internet and et cetera, et cetera. It was before the days of cell phones. It was a long, long time ago. And word was on the street in the Yukon about something really neat happening at NASCAD. So my point ultimately is, if you make an investment here, the big collective you, the big collective we, if we can make an investment here, people will come. Make something exciting happen here, and people will come. And so the point about how the word that's on the street right now is, is that NASCAD's in jeopardy and NASCAD's under, under siege, that is really, really, really detrimental to NASCAD's future. And I would really encourage any of you who are in a position to change that to do your best to do so. Max Haven, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Art and Public Policy Department at New York University, and I teach here Historical and Critical Studies. I would echo what the last speaker said, and also I would direct these comments towards our friends from the provincial government. I'm glad you're here. Um, you're a bit late. Uh, you should have been here about two years ago when this began, and we should have actually begun the discussion of those creative solutions that you mentioned. I think at this point, the fact is, I mean, it's a bad time. Uh, it's a bad time of year for all of us. But the fact that this room is impacted is also because this campus is utterly exhausted. Yes. You're looking at a contingent of people who not only have been fighting against uh, what we see as, as an attack from the provincial government. And you can say that that perception is wrong, but it is the perception here. We've been fighting this for two years. Meanwhile, NASCAD has the highest teaching load of professors in the city. Professors are bringing supplies from home because the budget's been cut to the bone. Administrators are going through recycling boxes to find enough paper to do photocopies on, if the photocopy budgets are not. Our students are working multiple part-time jobs in order to make ends meet because tuition keeps increasing each year. This school is the, one of the most efficient institutions in the province right now. Far more efficient, I would hazard, than even your own offices. So do not come here and tell us. Do not have the audacity to come and tell us that we are somehow an inefficient institution. We are working with nothing, nothing right now. And we do an amazing job. The school is on the precipice, though, of shifting over from being a world-class fine arts institution with a global reputation to being simply a, an offerer of a knowledge commodity in, in Nova Scotia. And I think your government needs to take, and you two in particular, because you're the strategists, right? Ministers come and go. We know what your job is. You need to make a decision, it might need to be today, it might need to be tomorrow, whether you want a world-class fine arts institution in the heart of Halifax, and whether you're willing to get the government to pay for it. If you decide you don't, continue to do what you're doing. If you do, you need to put the money on the table. I'm speaking frankly to you right now because this is the only chance we're going to get to talk. But the fact is, when I go around to various places, when I go to New York, people are flabbergasted that your government could make the decisions you've been making. You are poisoning the reputation of this province within the cultural sector. You may think that you have been 
propounding ideas about a new creative way of managing NASCAD, but how it appears from the outside. And it's not our fault for bringing bad media to the school. The appearance from the outside is that Nova Scotia is a cultural backwater, which doesn't even realize that it has in its capital city one of the finest fine arts institutions on the continent. So you need to make a decision now. And I don't want to hear any more things about you know, how great the new innovative future is going to be, or how wonderful an affiliation with Dow could be. You know what's going on. You know it better than me. You've done the research. I haven't. You need to make a decision whether you want this institution to thrive. And if you do, there needs to be money. It's not our fault. No one in this room, I hope, is responsible for the economic crisis that happened here. People here have been working for years on a shoestring. The fact that we got into trouble with a campus that shouldn't have been built or shouldn't have been built in the way that it was, that's not anyone's fault here in this room. And yet, over the last five years even, and especially over the last two, the people in this room have come under constant attack. That is the perception. Morale is at an all-time low. We are going to start losing faculty. We are already starting to lose students. Now is the time to turn it around. You need to make the decision to do that. We don't need more hot air about how we need to be more creative about the new economy future that is going to somehow save us or kill us. I don't even want you to respond to that because it's a moral decision that I think you need to make for yourselves. But if you want to respond, that's your prerogative. same speech from anti-poverty groups, from rural communities, from health boards, from rural small schools that are under threat. There are endless numbers of stakeholders who can come and give us that same speech about how you don't give us more money, you're somehow or other betraying something, etc., etc. But the same situation applies across the board and we're giving the same answer. There isn't more money. We are not going to solve NASCAD's challenge by building a $30 million new campus. It's not going to happen. So that's reality. That's where you begin to be creative and innovative, is by starting with reality, not with some fantasy about somehow or other if we do something politically or whatever, millions of dollars will materialize. This is a have-not province. It does not have the money to run 10 universities. We don't have two too many universities, we have too much university capacity. We have to somehow get those 10 institutions working together. Do we have to have 10 business or eight business schools in Nova Scotia? Do we need eight business schools? No, no cut those! Why is so we, need, we need one, and that's what we're working on. So we are putting substantial right? pressure on those eight universities to look at a way to deliver business programming in a way that the problems can afford, all right? And engineering schools, and nursing schools, and any number. That's what the university system is going to be dealing with because we cannot keep all those different programs going. How many other right. schools are in the province? One, okay. and that's what has to How be. How many business schools are in the province? Eight. How many nursing schools are in the province? Three. Exactly. So why all, are you so here and the, not there? All of those institutions, we are there. We are there. They're all going to be dealing with those challenges. So that's where we have to start working together. If, you, if the only political response you have is to say, you have to give us more money, take it from schools or hospitals or somebody else, then we will not resolve all the issues. How about Irving? Take it from them. They have lots of money. Money's so, money. Who do we keep the money? Irving, the, we are invest, the other part of the government uh, the other part of the government's overall direction here is, and we know it's going to take 10 to 15 years to do it, is to try to grow the economy so it can sustain a strong institutional base. Right now we can't. But isn't this part so of the economy? It is part of the economy, but, but this is the part of the economy that where 70% of the costs of operating it come out of the taxpayer's pocket, right? So we have to manage that in a different way than we do investments that are attempting to generate uh, private sector growth and so on. So this government is committed to trying to grow the economy, but it's not going to happen overnight. Maybe we will be a half province, and this will be a different conversation 10 to 15 years from now. 
but right now we're dealing with reality, which is that public sector spending is not going to transform this institutional base that we have. We need to do it in other ways, and so we will rationalize business schools, and we'll do a whole variety of things. NASCAD would not be even in this conversation were it not for that debt mode and the need to deal with its infrastructure. But it's not even the same kind of debt mode because the way we arrived in this situation was partly incurred by the, the mismanagement. Do you see what I mean? It's not just that we're running out of uh, students to educate. It's that if this school of mine has been ran flat for, for a very long time, yeah. some horrible bad decisions were made. Yeah, and I, I don't. This I don't personally spend a lot of time delving back into that history well, and of signing blame. Um, but this, this, this the hostility and the it's this toxic environment. And then we're being told that like, we're exhausted. Yeah, and I don't see you as the enemy, but this is kind of so personal, and I don't even understand the words of it. But I do understand that it's not quite the, the situation that it's the person. Um, it's not quite the same to me. Maybe that's because this is where I work in, with education. But well, let's get to that. I mean, to say, I don't spend a lot of time going back into the history of assigning blame. Here's the situation we're in now. This government has demonstrated a willingness to invest in solutions uh, in the direction that we have to go in. We have a $25 million innovation fund that's available to, to support kind of those new directions and so on. There'll be more of that money to the extent that we see success, but it's got to be moving towards a sustainable law. But Sandra, you wanted to come in here? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I'm okay with that. Um, Gabrielle, do you, did you want to, I think you covered it. Um, I just wanted to respond to two comments that I heard that I was offended by and I've heard many times. Um, the first one was, uh, Dan, you were talking about how enriching it would be to have all different kinds of people in our classes. And I just want to say I've heard that point of view a lot. In my personal life, I spend a lot of time mingling with philosophers and scientists, and it's deeply enriching to my personal life. But when we are in our classrooms, we speak a language that is so specialized that nobody that isn't an educated artist would understand it. It's as specialized a program as all the other programs, you would never talk about a chemistry class as being enriched by being flooded with painters. That would never happen. Um, um, you also wouldn't look at a chemistry classroom and think, well, I'm not a chemist, but it looks like you could probably jam another six people at this table, you know? So you're talking about class sizes and things like that. I want an artist to assess those things. Um, I want an artist to assess whether it's appropriate to have people who aren't highly specified educated artists to be in those classes. Um, all I was stressing was new control, uh, that access, and we will continue to control it. And again, we will only do it if it uh, makes sense and if there's justification for doing so. If there's not, we'll figure out another way of providing that type of uh, educational experience for non-artists. Uh, I agree with you, it wouldn't make any sense at all if the end result of the model such as you're describing now resulted in a dilution of the very uh, thing that we are attempting to uh, produce and attempting to facilitate, uh, and that is uh, uh, artists who uh, uh, can fly on their own. So uh, we, we wouldn't do that. But you have to have confidence. Um, all I'm asking you is not to judge it. Uh, and uh, that, that's all. Um, this, the second comment that offended me that I've heard more times uh, is um, this idea that we should stop having public actions because it makes us look bad. Um, as someone that's put a lot of effort into planning and executing those actions, um, we refuse to apologize to them and they will, they will continue. Um, <laughs> People keep saying we don't want to look like we're not on the same page. We are not on the same page. And your NDP voters, your NDP voters deserve to know that you are running a conservative platform. And if we have to tell them that, then we will continue to tell them that. Uh, just the 
one comment about the, the fixed pile of money. In the uh, MOU that you reached last year with the universities, there was an agreement that there would be a task force to look at the funding formula. Uh, so it, it appears to me that there's an agreement between the university presidents and the government that the funding formula that's currently being used may be flawed. And, and, and I'm just uh, outraged that, uh, that we can't wait for that discussion to take place. It seems to me the gun has to be taken away from NASCAD's head because the, the funding formula discussion may in fact come up with the conclusion that you can't have a one-size-fits-all funding formula for the universities, and that maybe the arts programs, the studio-based programs we have, are in fact underfunded. And what a shame it would be if the school is destroyed uh, because we can't wait until the results of the funding formula discussion actually takes place. Uh, well, uh, Alvin, you and I had that previous conversation, so. Yeah, I don't want to get bogged down in facts here, but um, NASCAP has been the big winner in the existing funding formula, more than any other institution. 70% of your funding comes from the government grant. The average across the universities is 45%. Students contribute 30% of the cost of their education. Uh, government contributes 70. Uh, uh, the average across the system is closer to 45, 50, uh, 55. Um, so that's got the bin weight system to get too technical here. Actually, your general arts, your <coughs> courses, are funded at a higher rate than general arts courses across the whole university system because NASCAD at the time when the formula was put in place chose to have a single bin weight for all of its programs and not try to differentiate out the technical uh, um, studio kind of work from the, that was a choice that NASCAD made. So your general kind of classroom lecture courses are far better funded by the formula but than... Maybe there's a problem with the BIN formula. Yes. Well, and that other universities, they don't have to fund their arts programs strictly on that envelope for the arts programs. If they can't afford to run the music program and that all the money that they get from the government for the music program, they have uh, tremendous resources from the courses where they have thousand students in an auditorium or twelve hundred students in an auditorium. And the fact that our liberal arts courses here, our history courses or our critical studies courses, have a higher bin weight than they do at Dow doesn't take into account that we have a lecture theater that uh, that might accommodate a hundred students, not eight hundred or twelve hundred as they do in Dow. So of course our liberal arts courses are more expensive to offer than they are at and those things hopefully would be taken into consideration when a close look is taken at how all the universities are funded. Hi there, my name is Bill Travis and I'm the Disability Resource Facilitator at NASCAD University. Um, the reason I'm speaking is because I'm in a, I'm in a I chose this career uh, which was supposedly uh, a career that came out of uh, a need for change in our country based on the World Health Organization signing a, a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and well more than 10 years ago now uh, that changed well the UN's view of what a disability is from something wrong with an individual to something wrong with society that the individual is in right so Canada is one of the first countries to sign this and I was very proud to be a Canadian when this happened um, mind you, funding for students with disabilities is still on a rehab model out of the 80s, right? You have to prove you have a disability, get your check, pay your tutors, whatever. Um, we're living in the past. Now, I, I don't want to go too far into that, but the reason I'm speaking is I, f I fear that enhancing access for students with disabilities is going to be lumped together with better gym memberships and better access to health care and all these other things that have nothing to do with a fine arts education uh, in terms of getting the public to swallow a pill that's going to reduce the effectiveness of this institution. I am here to commit my passion, my energy to ensure that students with disabilities and ASCAD get what they need to participate. Um, don't blame the facilities, don't blame the building. Uh, we can work around it. 
Uh, we've been doing it successfully for the, well, nine years I've been here. Uh, I just want to make sure it's not used in the argument to water down uh, the real purpose of NASCAD. Uh, if you're selling it to the public, giving them a pill, uh, saying, oh, look at the benefits of amalgamation, look at the benefits of a merger between NASCAD and Dalhousie. They're gonna, students are going to have a much better quality of life. Uh, students are going to have much better access to services. Well, those students aren't looking for those things because they're coming to NASCAD. They're choosing NASCAD. We need to make it work, but that's our job. I think there's a like complete misrepresentation of the role of the board in NASCAD and the role of administration. We're t there was a comment earlier that uh, students and faculty aren't in line with the institution's, uh, what the institution is saying. Yet we are the institution and the Board of Governors is a conduit between students and faculty and the government. They shouldn't, students shouldn't be out of line with what the board is saying. They should be listening to us and telling the government what we're saying. And I don't think that we're embarrassing the school. I'm embarrassed by the fact that NASCA was in Frank Magazine because a board member threw a beer on a student. That's embarrassing. And I don't know why that board member wasn't, fu wasn't fired off the board. It shows it's a complete disregard for students. And I think the Board of Governors is like a complete embarrassment to the school right now. that you'd like to uh, share with us? I think that was a question. Pardon? Is there not a question that last comment? It's not a question, it was a comment. Well, I, I thought... Well, I mean, uh, well, let, let, let me try to... I, I'm not going to convince anyone who has such strongly held views, but they're strongly held views. Uh, what I would suggest you do, we're not perfect, uh, the board here is not perfect. It's not a perfect world we live in. However, we do have a constitutional, uh, legislatively mandated governance structure here. And for better or for worse, it outlines the responsibilities assigned to the board. This board is a volunteer board who gains all uh, noticeable benefits from the hours and hours of work that they invest, other than their commitment and their uh, altruistic embracement of the values which are supposed to uh, depict who we are. And uh, But they have an obligation. They have a, a legislative obligation to manage the affairs of the university, manage the finances of the university, manage, uh, oversee management expenditures, oversee uh, property expenditures, uh, conduct government relations, officially represent the university to all the various constituent boards that we have to respond to, to provide a uh, respectable environment for our students and faculty. They do all of those things. That's, that's their obligation. They have no choice. Now, it doesn't feel like that's happening for you as a student. Well, we should have a conversation over it, but uh, I can't convince you otherwise. I've been having many conversations. I was on the student union for two years. I'm the chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students Nova Scotia. I've been in meetings with Sandra. I've been in meetings with David B. Smith, and I don't feel like anyone's being heard. Aside from the faculty and the students on the Board of Governors, how many of them are artists? I've heard rumors that there were pretty famous artists agreeing to be on the Board of NASCAD, and the board members had no idea who they were and rejected that. And I think they show real lack of foresight and real lack of creativity or innovation, whatever that means. The awkward word there is rumors. Hi, uh, my name is Ali Columbus, and I'm a fourth year fashion and textiles student. Um, currently, I have decided to not complete my finance degree here, um, if ever, because of what has been happening with NASCAD and how embarrassed, embarrassed I am of this um, 
every situation that has been happening. And for the past two years, I feel as though I've spent all of my tuition on something that has on this idea and this, I guess, problem. And my professors have been under so much stress, and that's all I really feel as though I've been taught is to stress out about everything that's been going on. Um, that makes sense. So I don't really think that I have learned anything in the past two years because of what the Board of Governors and the administration has done to my professors and to my technicians. Um, and it's a pretty big deal when you're a student and have $27,000 worth of student loans and no fine arts degree to be proud of. the last question or last comment, uh, Alma? Uh, I can foresee the possibility that uh, when the consultants who are conducting the uh, space and affiliation studies write the reports that they will say that NASCAD is operating very efficiently and that there are no major savings uh, to be gained from an affiliation. What then? Uh, What's, what's the government going to do if it turns out that in fact we are operating efficiently and the affiliation wouldn't save money? What's, what are the other options that are on the table? Well, I guess the, over, the overarching, again, this is not a NASCAR policy. What we're saying to the universities overall is that 13 14 is the last year of budget reductions, uh, cuts for this government. If the government changes, it would be a whole different situation. But uh, what we're saying is that this is the last year of cuts. After this year, we will enter into a, a period where the grants to the universities will grow by a measured amount in the 1 to 2% rate, basically covering inflation. So there will be no major growth in spending in the university sector in the near future. And there will be a cap on tuition growth, so that revenue source is... is so any university administration board can sit down right now and know what their revenue flow is for the next five, six, seven, eight years. Now, assuming I'm not a radical change in the government policy, uh, you know what your revenue base is. Uh, you also know that there's an innovation fund and there's a money available and the government's committed to helping, uh, you know, if institutions decide to make the kind of changes we feel are needed to achieve sustainability, uh, in NASCAT's case to deal with its debt situation, perhaps its campus set up and so on, uh, there will be a willingness to look at strategic investments that move it towards a sustainable excellence model, all right? That's the world we're in. That's the world we're in. So, you know, I mean, people can accuse each other and call each other names all day long, but those of you who are exerting leadership at NASCAD need to exert leadership in the context, this is the world we're in. We know what our revenue flow is going to be. We need to manage things in such a way that we do not see an enrollment decline, because that would be very, that would change the picture in a very negative way. So we need to get some really positive messages out in relation to the future of the institution. I think we also need to communicate a willingness to look at, you know, kind of a change that would contribute to a positive outcome. Uh, those are the choices that are, you know, faced. Now again, you may be defeating the government and hoping for something better is, is, a, is a viable strategy you might want to pursue. Um, uh, I, I, from where I see inside the government, I'm not sure what options a new or different government will have, but they may be able to come up with things. But I, those of you who are exerting, exercising leadership in the faculty, among the students, and the board, and so on, I really hope that you can frame your op, your choices in that context of, uh, here's our financial situation right now, here's the ability of the government to support us in the future, uh, here are the assets that we have to work with to try to find uh, solutions. And I, I agree that the communications has not been great over the last year or so. Uh, we've allowed things at times to, uh, 
who get more conflictual than they need to be. It hasn't helped uh, any of us deal with the situation. Uh, we're committed on our side to do better. If the affiliation study, Alvin, indicates that not only you know, it doesn't say much, but it also doesn't promise us a more robust and more dynamic uh, institution, then who's going to go there? The government's not going to do it just for the sake of change, right? We, we're looking for, again, I hate the jargon, but sustainable excellence uh, going into the future. And uh, if it's not there, then then we're back to living within that budget. But you, you talked about strategic investments. When uh, the agricultural college merged with Dow, there was an investment from the government of $9 million to help pay for the, the merger. Yeah. Uh, if we had a strategic investment of $9 million to pay off the debt on the Ford campus, we wouldn't be in this conflict. We wouldn't have to be in this room today. Uh, is that one of the options if the report comes back and says that there are no long-term gains from is, would the government consider that kind of strategic investment? And if you could get that message out, that would go a long way to allowing us to begin the serious discussion that Sandra's talking about, about how we improve quality of education, because you'd be taking the gun away from our head. There, we are having the conversation with a number of institutions, all of whom are experiencing um, pressures and um, all of them are experiencing pressures because the world is changing and I'm not I'm, I feel confident in saying that buying debt will not be one of the solutions because the government would have to extend that to every institution with with very large quantities of debt so um, the notion that they can buy the debt is I, I, don't, I don't believe that's a... Um, How would you describe the $9 million that you gave to Dow for the merger? Uh, well, whatever word you use to label that, use that word to give us the $9 million. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for $130 million. <laughs> I don't question I, 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 that. I guess all I'm saying is that uh, uh, we need a handout. And, uh, uh, to get us out of the jam, and it would be a one-time payment the same way that the nine million, the Dow was a one-time payment to make the merger happen. And if it, if it would take uh, that small amount of money to solve this problem and, and set us forth on another 125 years of successful education and visual arts, it seems to me a very good investment for the government to make. I'll take that back. Well, uh, one, one more question, and then I think we'll wrap up. It's, uh, it's approaching five o'clock. Um, well, then, just, can I just quickly, I don't want to take more than 30 seconds to add to the discussion we just had. It's making it really hard for us to fundraise um, with this situation of instability and, and uncertainty. So addressing the money with the gun to our head in this way is is is, is like chawing our feet and telling us to run forward. Yeah. yeah. I'd also like to point out that the other institutions that are feeling the pressures are proceeding with fundraising. No other institution is in this situation. I beg to differ. I was another institution yeah. was the subject of all of those five government funded reports aimed at solving the financial problem. Which institution do you When I say I beg to differ, the, the, every institution is experiencing pressures right now. Every institution is experiencing pressures. In the paper, they're writing about those pressures. A lot of uh, the there's a number of institutions that are feeling the the, the difficulty of changing enrollments and um, the uh, the demographic changes and a variety of different things. But that's uh, not the same as trying to get people to invest in a school that they don't even know if it's going to be there in two years or three years. That is, a, you're you're comparing once again apples and oranges. It's not the same thing at all to say that they're in financial constraints, and so are we, when we can't get people to invest in a school that they don't even know is going to be here. That was the problem with the port, trying to get people to invest in something that, or trying to be built a building without investment. So we need investment from fundraisers, and who's going to invest in a, who's going to invest in a building we don't own on a lease down there? That's the same problem. 
I guess it's the way this, the conversation is shaped. And I mean, I, I feel that, you know, we're getting into a, a more heated debate now and that if I offer something, it's gonna get shut down. But um, the, the conversation I'd like to offer is that I believe NASCAD is going to exist into the future. I believe the people in this room believe NASCAD will exist into the future if we work together. The Premier has said that, the, uh, that there is going to be a vibrant, independent NASCAD into the future, that we need to work together to creatively look at what some of the options are to solve some of the pressures right now. The, it's, it's, it's the way the conversation is being cast. Um, I don't, I've never been in a room where the government has said, we're holding a gun to your head. Um, I've never been in a, a room where um, it's been said that we're trying to uh, facilitate you to your demise. Um, it is, I believe, that the conversation that we're trying to have is, yes, there's constraints. I, I was in a room where the government told me that they were going to fire the board. I, I took that to mean that there was a government. Okay, I wasn't there, Alvin. So, uh, so I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just saying I wasn't there. My, my final point is this. I'm afraid you're going to walk out of this room with the impression they just don't get it. They think that there's going to be a handout. They're not getting the message. There's nothing we can do. They just aren't reading the tea leaves. I'm really concerned that that's what you're going to walk away with. And my message to you is please hear what's been said here today in a variety of ways, which is Alvin's point and Jane's point, which is that there is a feeling here. There's perception here that there is a gun being held to NASCAD's head. And government can do something about that to change the tenor of the message and the tenor of the discussion. You have the power to change the tenor of the discussion because the policy leadership comes from government. short notice and not the uh, best time in the year, but uh, as I mentioned when we began, it was either having it now or not having it at all. It only gets worse in terms of scheduling uh, to this point. So uh, thanks for coming, thanks for sharing your, your views, and uh, thank you for our brave uh, guests who uh, uh, I should remind you did not need to do this. Uh, they offered to do this. And uh, I think they, uh, they showed some degree of bravery for ending the, uh, the barefoot. So thank you very much.